Okay, everybody, Steve here talking about the 50th anniversary of the Beatles coming to America and really breaking out as a gigantic, uh, most popular, most successful band probably of all time. That was 50 years ago in February. This is February of 2014, and it's going to be my birthday next week, and I'm going to be 50 years old. So I thought, I don't know, I just had this idea to do a YouTube video that would kind of combine those two things and hopefully teach you some things and encourage you about your art by telling you a little bit about what made the Beatles great and uh, how that also relates to some of the things that I've done. Okay, so think about this. 1964, the Beatles come to America. Uh, they just started to get some airplay. They went to Shea Stadium. They were on the Ed Sullivan Show. And then they were huge, just, you know, gigantic. There was nothing like it. Uh, probably never will be because there's so many different types of music now from so many different sources. Anyway, um, first thing, which you don't maybe realize, is that uh, John Lennon and Paul McCartney had been performing together since 1957 or 58. I think they started in 57. They, uh, Paul McCartney invited George Harrison, who was only 14 years old, to join their little band uh, in 1958. So by the time 1964 came, everybody said, hey, there's an instant success. It was not instant. They'd been playing over and over again, night after night after night. They could not get a good break. They had to play in these crummy little clubs. They couldn't even get a gig in Liverpool. They had to play, in, I mean, in, in London. They could only play in an industrial blue-collar city like Hamburg, Germany, or in Liverpool in England. Um, so lesson number one, don't give up. Work hard, keep doing it, and eventually you will get better. Uh, Duh, right? Everybody knows that, but I don't know, sometimes you just need to be reminded of that. I think especially when you see things uh, on TV or maybe even sometimes when you read a, a synopsis, you, you, don't, you don't hear about the hundreds of hours of work that goes into getting really, really good. But there's no substitute for hard work and long hours and lots of practicing. It's true for music. It's true for art. Um, the other thing I found really interesting as I thought about this was how the Beatles, uh, if you listen to their first recordings... And then you listen to them just at the end of their, uh, what was it, uh, from like 63, 62 or 63, the first record came out, they ended in 70. So they didn't even make records for 10 years, and yet there was a cr tremendous amount of diversity and development. And so one of the things they did that I would recommend that lots of people do is you absorb your influences and you do something with those influences. In other words, you don't try to pretend that you're not influenced by somebody. One of the things that we as artists want to do is we want to be original. We want to be the first ever to do something, and that's commendable, but it's not realistic. The, the truth is, if you're going to do anything, you're going to be copying somebody to some extent in some way. And that's true for painters. Uh, you're, you're going to try to paint a little bit like somebody, and that's okay because at least you're doing something. One of the things that can happen, I think, for artists is that you just kind of freeze. You think, i got to do something so original that's never been done before that you really you don't do anything, and that, that would be a shame. <laughs> so so don't do that. Uh, if you listen to the early Beatles, they were clearly influenced. Uh, John Lennon says it wasn't for Elvis. I never would have. There, there would be no Beatles. He was a huge Elvis fan. Uh, in their style, you hear uh, Buddy Holly, and that's why they named it the Beatles instead of the Crickets. They used the Beatles. Uh, the Everly Brothers with their vocal harmonies. And their early recordings, they didn't write all original songs. That's not what you did back then. You cover other songs. And so they were influenced by, uh, like, um, um, oh... Little Richard, they were influenced by him tremendously, and they even covered some of his music. They covered other people's music at first because they didn't even have enough songs. And uh, after a few years, they realized, hey, we could write our own songs and make more money and, you know, kind of do our own thing. And, of course, they developed like crazy. They met Bob Dylan. Uh, he had a huge influence on them. Uh, everybody they met, they were absorbing things, and I encourage everybody as an artist to do that. Um, it's also interesting to know that Bob Dylan met the Beatles, and within a year, he was now using electric guitars in a full band, and he got everybody mad because he was no longer a folk purist. At the same time, after the Beatles met Bob Dylan, uh, they started to use acoustic instruments a little bit more, and they were more diversified, and they were kind of embracing the folk thing while uh, Bob Dylan was going the opposite direction. So they both influenced each other, apparently. It's just a little trivia of history. Um, the thing I was going to show you was some of the artists that I was really influenced by, and you'll see uh, some of the... Um, the impact that it had on me right away. One of the first ones, the earliest ones, would be... Uh, uh, nice, I showed you the cover with nothing on it that tells you who it is, right? Anyway, this is Andrew Wyeth. This is uh, Wyeth at Kerner's, which got mildew because it was in the basement, and it makes me sad, but still. Um, 
Here's an example of one of his landscapes. This book has a lot of his, his rough sketches. It doesn't have as many finished paintings. Um, but he had a huge influence on me. When I was only in, I think, fifth or sixth grade, a neighbor showed me his work. And uh, that's what got me started on doing watercolors to begin with. It was just, uh, you know, Andrew Wyeth is watercolors. I'll do watercolors. When I was in um, art school in Chicago, I heard about a handful of painters. I think this might be the first little booklet in 1985 uh, called Heart Heartland Painters. This is a, a painting by James Wynn. And you can, you can see... Oh, oh, I know where Steve got some of his ideas for sure. Absolutely. I was really influenced by Jim's work and uh, the other guys in here, uh, Jim Butler especially too. And then um, the other guy was Harold Greger. And, and Harold Greger also did these paintings. In fact, Harold Greger would have been my professor if I had stayed at ISU. Uh, but one of his students did turn out to be uh, James Wynn, who I was just showing you. Um, but uh, Harold Gregor is one of the first guys to use a photorealistic style, but he was portraying farmland in the Midwest with that wide open space. And uh, that had a huge impact on me. Um, let's see if I got something else here. Uh, well, this is the second catalog that came out uh, about a year later from this. The same gallery in, uh, in Chicago at the time had this exhibit. And these little books, you know, just a handful of works of art. This was uh, George Atkinson. He did these pastels. I love this one. I um, I was like, okay, somebody's doing something like this, and that means maybe I can do something like this. In fact, uh, when I was in art school at Illinois, I'm sorry, not Illinois, at the American Academy of Art. I was only there for a year and a half. I dropped out. I ran out of money. But I used to go to the Art Institute, and you could check out paintings, not check out books. You could check out actual paintings. They had a, a big uh, Jim Wynn, this guy. They had one of his paintings in their collection. And on my lunch hour, I would go in there, and I would have them take it out of the storage and put it on the wall, and I would just sit there and go, he is so much better than me. I have really got to work at this. I have really got to focus. I've got to figure out whatever he's doing and somehow try to be as good as him. And uh, that's a positive thing. It, it, uh, it was the um, inspiration that made me do the paintings that at first looked very reminiscent, very similar to Jim Wynn's paintings. In fact, uh, I got to meet him and uh, he's been kind of like a big brother to me and uh, I still admire his work. Um, but what I wanted to say was, don't be afraid of sort of imitating or at least adopting the style of another artist. That's okay. Beatles did it. Work for them, right? And eventually you're going to develop your own style. And it's the working and working and working, making new paintings, learning something from that painting. Maybe something works, something maybe didn't work, but you learn something and you go to the next painting. It's a process. Uh, you can stop yourself from accomplishing anything by trying to make the greatest work of art ever. I think that doesn't happen very often. I think what happens is you make a great work of art after you make a whole bunch of less than great works of art. And you learn a lot of lessons along the way. And, and the, the great work of art sometimes just kind of shows up uh, in that long process. Another painter I wanted to show you, this is, uh, this is a book on photorealism. And this is Richard, I don't, know, I, I don't remember if I'm supposed to say Richard Estes or Richard Estes. Anyway, Richard Estes is one of my favorite painters. And he does more cityscapes, obviously. This is New York. Most of his work is New York. And um, huge impact on me. I've seen uh, hardly any of his work in, in person, but I actually own the books that are published of his work. And I just love the boldness of them. I love that feeling of space. Uh, I love the use of color even. Like uh, this is one with orange in it. I don't have a lot of orange. There's not a lot of orange in nature. So, in fact, I'll show you this one right here. Hope you can see this okay. This one with these, these plastic shopping carts. I love that painting. I don't, I don't even know exactly why. There's something intuitive about just saying, I love it. I don't have to have a complex theory. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of things going on with the feeling of space and the perspective, which he often uses. Anyway, um, I'm trying to think if there's something else I was going to say, because I'm doing this off the top of my head. One of the things that I'm trying to do with these videos is not to uh, make them perfect, because that would mean I would never do them. So I uh, hope this has been inspirational to you. And... Uh, the thing I was going to show you next is this is the painting I'm going to be doing next. It's just a drawing. I'm going to talk about that more in a separate video. I don't want to make this too long. Thanks.